Okay. And no, I did not copy. Mm -hmm. When you're performing a cylinder leakage test, if the engine has a distributor... I got page numbers written by them. If the engine has a distributor, the technician should remove the cap and rotate the engine until the rotor points at the test cylinder's firing point. True. What if you don't have a distributor cap? Yeah, I remember that question. Huh? Said it yeah. Well, if you got it where the if you got it where the distributor cap is pointing, you know, on where the rotor is pointing at the place on the cap where the distributor fires, you pretty well have the idea that both of those valves are closed. Mm -hmm. That's what you do for that. Now, the problem with that is you don't know on one that doesn't have a distributor, and most of our vehicles nowadays don't have distributors. Most of them don't have distributors. Hey. That needs to go both ways. Um, what we need to do is uh, call up four nine three zero six eight zero and talk to Brett. Don't talk to anybody but Brett. Tell him I told you to call him and explain the problem. Okay. okay see how that works. What's the number? Four, four nine three zero six eight zero. Four nine three zero six eight zero. Say that with me. Four nine three zero six eight zero. All right. Four nine three zero six eight zero. Yeah. Eight zero. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, so let me ask you this. Come here, man, man. I have a question that's pretty important. All right. Now then, let me ask you this. If you don't have, you know, you, you remember the, the question, the very first question I meant about if you point the distributor, I mean the rotor at the distributor firing point, like if you're going to do a cylinder leakage test on cylinder number four because you think that's the one that's giving you trouble, and you, they say you point your distributor cap at that, that's telling you both your valves are closed and you need it. You need to do it both valve closed, right? Remember that? What if it doesn't have a distributor and it's cylinder number four? And that's not the companion to number one. How do you find it? See, this is important. I mean, we need to be, we need to end up be talking about this. What did they say in your book? You say anything about that? Uh, how do you find top dead center though? There's no marks on the balancer at four. Wouldn't you do it like we did the, the 350? Take the spark plug out, stick a rag in there, and spin the engine until. Well, let me, you got cylinder leakage though, yeah. and you don't know where it's going, so it may not even blow the rag out. If it does, it's left. That's why you need that little spark plug tester, isn't it? Sort of, but that thing is. Uh, that's what you he fouled that one too? Yeah. Okay, call him up. Okay. Give him a hard time. All right. But yeah, you got to know the firing order to begin with. Okay. All right. So I've got my. <clears throat> I know that number one. See, I got to usually have a pointer right here, and I know that whenever I bring my. Let's say that the uh, third firing order is fourteen twenty five thirty six, like it is on the Taurus or the Ranger, or whatever out there. Okay. And we got the bark right here on your balancer. And when you turn that thing around uh, and, it, and it's lined up, you're going to be on one of two cylinders. You're going to be top dead center on two of the pistons, but only one of the cylinders is going to be on compression. You don't know which one, right? You better find out which one. Now, the rag thing, if cylinder number one is not the one you're uh, trying to, you know, measure, then if it blows the rag out and you can find it that way, that's your starting point. That's the only way. If you, When you know what cylinder number one top dead center compression is, now, if you got it on top of that center number one exhaust, you're, you know, you're all fouled up. Okay, so how many cylinders we got here? Six. How many degrees between fire and events on a six-cylinder? Okay. Remember? 120. 120, that's right, man. Okay, so I've got 120 degrees of crankshaft rotation. Now, this, is, this, is come, this comes to the point of where, you know, you, you can't just wing it. You know what I mean? You're just about going to have to figure out some kind of a way. What I would do... If I was fighting with this, is I would get me something that cardboard, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Something that I could use. And I would mark it for 120 degrees. Whatever 120 degrees is. You know, it's gonna be three three times in a circle. Like in other words, you got a circle and you make a pie, it's 120 degrees. So basically this is gonna look more like that, isn't it? Yeah. Alright. So if I get me a piece of cardboard and I make it so that I got 120 degrees there, all right. And I hold that piece of cardboard. If I can figure out, make this happen, and it's going to be a little tricky, but you can do it. Even if you've got your 
pulley where your belts are. You know, like a lot of times you'll have your balancer, and then you'll have your pulley, and then you'll have your belts and all that nonsense out there. It doesn't really matter. You can hold this thing up to that circle. This is something I just came up with on my own. I don't, I've never seen anybody teach this before. All right, so I get my, uh, my pulley, and I, I make sure that my center of my thing's in the middle of that. All right, now that I've got number one, I'm going to make a mark right over here. You see, now if you want to, you can punch a bunch of holes in a line, <laughs> you know, on this thing right here. And then you can take your little white out that you got, and you can, through the these holes, you know where that one is. got to line that first one over here. So you line the first one up with a mark on number one, the zero mark, and then you're going to mark this one right here. And then you're going to shift your piece of cardboard around so that one's lined up with that one. Then you're going to mark it. You're going to have all three of those marks made. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you know why we're doing this? Yeah. You understand why we're doing it? Because we're, we've actually marked every time one of those marks lines up with that pointer, if you're turning the crankshaft through, a different cylinder is on top dead center. Oh, okay. If you're between here, they could be somewhere else. But if every time you stop that thing on a, on a six cylinder, every time you stop it on 120 degrees, you're going to have a cylinder on top dead center. Now, which way does the engine turn? If I'm looking at it, which way does it turn? Got any idea? Quite well. Okay, looking at the front of the engine, does it turn? Does it turn that way or that way? Clockwise. Right, it's going to go that way, isn't it? Because you've actually got zero, ten, twenty, thirty. Wait a minute. Does it turn clockwise? Counterclockwise. Or counterclockwise. Counterclockwise. What? They, they're different on different engines. Like it, like Eric's car that had the engine in it backwards that we worked on so long and a little. Yeah. It turned backwards. <laughs> it turned. In other words, you can look at the engine in the car. All right. Which end is the engine on? If you're looking at the front of the car and the engine is on the end, I mean, the, if you're standing in front of the car, the engine is always going to be turning towards you. Right? The reason is because it's got to turn the wheels and they got to come towards you. Think about that. See what I'm saying? It's because the engine's got to be turning. This is the kind of stuff that if I don't tell you, you won't ever think about it, right? All right, now look at that. See what we got? Now, we got to know which way it's turning to begin with, regardless of what motor it is. If, like, look at it. If it's in a car sideways, you know, it's going to be turning towards you, all right, which is clockwise uh, on the Taurus. Now, on the Mitsubishi or some of the Kia, I mean, I'm sorry, some of the uh, Hondas, it's going to be turning the other way. Hmm. If it's a Chevrolet Corvair, it's turning the other way. Most people don't even think about that. Well, it has to because you'd have to have all this gearing in the transmission. If you're going to put the motor in there backwards, you better darn sure have it running backwards or you're going to have to have four reverse gears. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. I mean, no, yes, that's, that's just simple engineering. All right, so now then, you've determined that every, you know, and if it's a four-cylinder, what would you have? That one's even easier. If it's a four-cylinder, then your firing order is one, three, four, two. What are you going to do? How many degrees between firing events? 90. Well, no, no, 180. 180. 90 on a V8. Okay, so on that one, you're going to draw a line directly on the other side. So every time you turn it a half around, you got another cylinder on top of the center. Okay. But you see them pistons in there. These on the outside are going like this, on the inside, this one's on each end. All right, so that's what you got. Think, think about that. Okay, you're going to do your cylinder leakage test. You start out on cylinder number one. You turn it 120 degrees, and, and you turn it the direction it runs. You make darn sure you know that. Don't get confused. Don't, you know, turn off your radio so you don't get, you know, where your radio talks you or whatever. Four. It's going to be the next one that's going to come up on compression. Right? Mm -hmm. So now you know. If you've turned it 120 degrees and it was on top dead center compression on one, and you can start anywhere. Let's say that, Ben, let's say it is one. All right? You could back up and which one? Put it on six. Put your rag in six or your little rubber cork or whatever. You know, have your little box of them mm -hmm. that will go in there and bump it over until it goes and the cork pops out of six. Then you, you know, Get that son of a gun where you know it's on top dead center. Then you turn it on around, you know, another 120 degrees. And if you stop on your zero mark for your time, and you know you're on one anyway. And that's how, you, that's how you're going to find it like that. Anyway, find it like that. Yeah, if you don't have a distributor, you got to have something else. Most cars don't have distributors nowadays. Can I get a witness? Okay. So that one there, 
basically, number one is not, you know, yes, it's true, but what if you don't have a distributor? And I despise questions like that that assume everybody's got a distributor. This is a, this is a question that's written from an old school of thought from somebody that wrote the book a long time ago when I read the distributor, and it was an easy question to calibrate the leakage tester to read 0% when connected to the cylinder to be tested. True or false? Um, calibrate it when it's not connected. You don't want it connected to anything. As a matter of fact, you want it where no air can come out of it at all. And you turn that little regulator knob until that thing comes to zero because it's equal to zero leakage. And then after you've done that, you're going to connect it to your cylinder. You're going to screw your uh, little hose with the spark plug threads on the end of it into that thing, snap that leaker test tester on there, and look at the percentage of leakage. The PCM uses the camshaft position to determine when to fire the spark plug. <coughs> now, this is uh, it, the answer key says true, um, but there's issues with that. Um, there was a Ford Tempo one time that I worked on that was a 92 model. And it had come out of the body shop. And they had rear-ended somebody. And it broke the distributor. Well, in 92, because of the, uh, for whatever reason, Ford had decided to put a cam position sensor on the Tempo. Now, the Tempo before, you remember when we were talking about these um, distributors? This distributor here, this Hall effect, you know, somebody noticed this the other day, I, mean, I can't remember who it was, how when, I, when this turns through, you notice one of these little windows has got a different width to it than the rest of them. Mm -hmm. See that one there? That one there, see if I can hold it where it's really visible. See, one of them's wider than the rest of the windows. Mm -hmm. See how that one there, and the, the little, you really see the, the tab's not as wide too. That is how it used to determine what cylinder was what. The signature pip, they call it. That's what Ford did. But then on the, on the tempo, it had a fill veins because it was a four-cylinder, and they put all of these the same size on the 92, 93, and 94 models because the last three years they made it, and they put a cam sensor in the block. So they did away with They stopped using this for that. I mean, they still had this in there, but it, all of these were the same size. All right? And the PCM was expecting all of these to be the same size. And whenever they got a distributor out of the parts room, whoever it was that put together the rebuilt distributor parts list just says, oh, tempo distributors are the same as they've always been. And so they threw them one that had this little narrow window on it. You see, well, that wasn't telling it when to fire the spark. But it was the, the PCM was counting on all these being the same. And it got one that had a, a skinny one on it. Well, you know what would happen whenever they would crack the throttle on that thing? It would completely, one firing spike would totally go away. It would quit firing one of the spark plugs. One particular spark plug would just lose its spark. Now put the scope on it and say, what? This doesn't even make sense, you know? But it was because of the fact that the cam, the, the, this was different. Now, the cam sensor is typically there. Uh, when they put the cam sensor on there, it's typically there so it'll know which fuel injector to squirt first if it's got sequential fuel injection. That's usually what that's used for. Now, nobody knows all the programming. This is a bad question. I don't like it. Because there's sometimes, if you read this question right here, you would never, ever see a question like this on an ASC test. Because you've got to have questions on an ASC test that covers all the cars. You can't have them, it just covers one. Okay, now, uh, it, it's that question, according to the answer key, is supposed to be true, but I don't like it. A blown turbocharger seal can cause white exhaust smoke. A blown turbocharger seal, what color exhaust smoke would it cause? Blue. Blue. Because blue is? Oil. Oil. And white is? Coolant. Coolant. And black is? Uh, rich. Hmm? Rich fuel. Rich fuel, yeah. Hydrocarbons. It's sooty rich, yeah. Okay. Identify the letter of choice that best completes the statement or answers the question. Number five, repair of the engine is needed if cylinder leakage tests are more than A, 10%, B, 15%, C, 20%, or D, 30%. It's a dog, in it? D, 30%. Technician A said the cylinder leakage test can help the technician evaluate the severity of an engine mechanical problem and pinpoint the cause. Technician B says a cylinder leakage test can detect faults with valves, rings, pistons, and head gaskets. Who is correct about that? Yeah, that's, that, that's good. Uh, both of them guys know what to talk about. Um, 
what we're trying to do, and you say, like, I remember this worksheet I gave you on this. You know, you, you're going to put the cylinder, you're going to put the air in there, and then you're going to listen. Now, I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to find out how much cylinder leakage I've got. And then I'm going to get that dead gun cylinder leakage test out there, and I'm going to shoot straight air in there. I'm going to talk about shop air, 120 pounds, whatever, because you're going to hear it a lot better than you are, this silly little regulated amount of air that comes out of there. You put that in there and listen everywhere that it can possibly come out. Crankcase, radiator, intake, exhaust, you know, that kind of stuff. So whenever you figure out where the air is going, that's when you know where the problem is. You basically, before you ever break into that darn thing and start ripping it apart to replace stuff, it's a good idea to know what you're going after. <coughs> so you know I've got an intake valve. And I know it's on cylinder number four. You know exactly where to look when you go in there. A burned exhaust valve is indicated if A, air escapes from the intake, B, air escapes from the oil filter cap opening, C, air is heard at the tailpipe, or D, bubbles are seen in the radiator. Air is heard in the tailpipe. we got to be from the tailpipe. Technician A says the condition of the vehicle should be considered before replacing faulty valves in the customer's engine. Right? Mm -hmm. Technician B says replacing faulty valves will restore the compression pressure. Hmm. What do you think about that? You like that answer? Okay. Yeah, the, um, number eight. It will. Now, the problem that that's going to be uh, that's going to be a, a C thing, but um, it will only restore the compression pressure if the valves are the problem. Eight C. Yeah, according to the answer key. This is a brief story here. Then we'll try to get us out of here quick today. But um, the problem that we got one time this. Uh, Pickup truck came in there, and my compadre over there that was working in the, auto, I mean, in the uh, drivability department was Philip Kirkland. He was a guy that worked over with me. And, uh, skipping on cylinder number five. Pulls a spark plug out of cylinder number five. And when he gets the spark plug out of cylinder number five, the issue that he runs into there is that the spark plug is all blistered and burned up. And like it's like somebody hit it with a torch. I mean, it's in bad shape. We got you some bolts there, by the way, JT. But, um, they may be longer than when you want, but we can do. We can deal with longer. We just can't deal with shorter. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now you listen up. Listen to what happened here. This is important. F one fifty, three hundred two. Skipping on number five. It's cooked a spark plug for whatever reason. Blistered it, burned it, boiled it. You know, just, just like I'm telling you, it looked like somebody just really overheated that spark plug big time. Okay. Now he put another spark plug in it, and it seemed to run okay. Come back the next day, and the brand new spark plug looked the same way. How about the cylinder trying to leak? He does a compression test. You, you're close. He does a compression test, and he finds out that all the cylinders on the engine have got 160 to 170 pounds. That one's got 120. Okay, we got a compression problem. Mm -hmm. We got an intake valve. It's not seating good. We're pulling air in there. You know, the injector sprays right before the valve opens. But the valve is letting air go in there all the time. So the JT's right. It's running lean. And because it's running lean, it's running super hot. Remember what we were talking about last week? Lean is hot. Rich is cool. It's running super lean. And it's burning. It's like having a... The thing is, you know, with 2,500 degree combustion chamber temperatures, if you got a little extra air going in there, it's like pulling the trigger on your dadgum torch. And it's in the, in the spark plug... Incidentally, on some of these spark plugs, you know, like on some of the hybrid vehicles, and he didn't talk about this the other night, they're actually marked so you'll know that they're pointing at the valve. You know, the gap has got to be pointing at the valve. And race car people have been doing that for years, mm -hmm. pointing it right at the valve. Anyway, the point is, uh, so he pulls the, uh, they take the truck, the, this thing's been running real hot for a long time, and you know, in there. Hadn't damaged anything else, but it's sure cooked in plugs and stuff. I say that, you know, put it over a Pull his valve job, put it back on. And now the thing is skipping on number five. It's weak, you know, it's not right on number five. The compression is good on number five. The shop foreman, you know, I had this machine I got for cleaning injectors. And they had these, you know, the little flow ball that floats up in the, mm -hmm. you know, in the, uh, they had these things that we would run fuel through there, and you'd get an injector, and they had a gray band, an orange band, a blue band for whatever injectors it was. And you, what you're supposed to do is hook an injector up, put a container, Turn on the pump in the machine, and the machine would operate the injector at a particular pulse width. And you would actually watch that ball float up, and if it floated up in the range of where the gray injector was supposed to be, which is 14 pounds of fuel per hour, then that injector was flowing good. Well, I had already discovered that I couldn't trust that machine because it would tell me a lie. I would test my injectors. They would test uh, crappy, and I would clean them, and they would still test crappy, but the car would run better. 
And I said, it's just a waste of my time. It's not going to tell me the truth. There were times so I'm not going to use it anymore. Well, the shop foreman told the guy that was working on the truck because it was still skipping after he mentioned he did the valve job on it. He sent him over there without communicating with me anything at all. I didn't even know what this guy was working on. He walks into my service bay and he says, can you chest test this injector to see if it's working right? So I hooked it up to, you know, a little wire and I hooked it up to the battery and I shot some carburetor spray through it. And I said, yeah, it's shooting, you know, fuel. I can't say that it, and it's not leaking. So I don't really see that there's anything particularly wrong with the injector, at least from what I'm seeing here. Well, what the shop foreman wanted me to do was hook it up to that machine and which wouldn't have told the truth half the time anyway. You can't tell by that. So we went back over there, and when he, and when the, I told him the injector was okay, he made the call that they were going to put an engine in it. <laughs> so they put an engine in the truck. Now, it wasn't a customer's truck. Granted, it was a used car department owns the truck. And, the, you know, the bill on that truck, it was a nice truck. It was like an expensive engine job. But there was a communication breakdown here. So the shop foreman comes over here and said, this truck's still skipping on that same cylinder. I just put a long block in it, you know, which they put the old injectors and all back in it. And so I cleaned the injectors and it ran smooth. You know what I mean? So he was pretty hot about it. But what I told him is, he, you know, he said, you should have checked it with this machine. I said, you didn't tell me you want to do that. I didn't know that was a truck you were working on. I mean, I'm aware in my own little world, and he brings this stuff in here. It's time for me to pay you. Yeah, if you're ready. I need yeah, you to do something for me. Can you do something for me? Sure. I'm going to send you on an Easter egg hunt. Okay. Open the console on my Jeep, my yellow Jeep out there, and you'll find a check in the side of it, and it has not been written to anybody. Pull that check out and bring it to me, and I'll write you a check. Oh, yellow Jeep. Yeah, my yellow Jeep. All right. So, the point is, that's, there's a bunch of things you can learn from that. To begin with, everybody needs to communicate with everybody else very well. Got it? You know, there are some people that will say three words when they need to say ten words, assuming the other person understands their point. You see what I'm saying? It's not smart. Another thing, well, I'd say the, like I say, the used car market thing got and sold it before we get the money back anyway. And the guy, whoever got it, was really happy because he had a brand new engine. <laughs> I mean, so it wasn't a bad thing, but if it had been a customer truck, it would have been a disaster. I knew you'd find that out there. Yeah, it wasn't hard. How much was it? 4527 Yeah. That's, no, 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 that's, that's the not other one. 46.76. Okay. Okay, but anyway... He charges me forty six seventy six for my uniforms. How much is that? A week. That's four weeks. Well, almost twelve. The only uniform. Eleven and twelve. Yeah. The only just We can, but I don't ever turn mine in. You rascal. Well, the cleaner they use is high grade chemical, and I, I don't care for it. It gets clean, but I don't know. Can you take mine home and wash it for me? And <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you check this patch that's coming off of that other. Yeah, I'll, go, I'll get that fixed. This the morning. one that I got the oil on. Hey, you know what I did the other day? I was pumping the oil out when nobody was here but me. And I, somehow or another, whenever I, I, turned, I didn't have this thing turned all the way up, I don't know if I bumped it or whatever. And when I shot the air pressure to it, it went. And it went in my hair, it went on my shirt, it went all over the floor. <laughs> Y'all never knew because I cleaned it up. It was all clean. <laughs> it was embarrassing. But anyway, it messed up. It got all over this, the, the patch on the side of the shirt. Sure, Richard messed it up when we're not here. I know. Mm -hmm. and if I mess up, it's always your fault. Right. Yeah, so, I just thought it was nasty. I mean, I've, you know, every now and then I won't even make a mistake. Okay, um, I, well, actually, I thought I made a mistake one time, but I found out later that I didn't. So, all right. <laughs> Actually, it was a mistake when I thought I made a mistake and found out I didn't, okay? I got that from Mr. Waters over at high school. He, he told me that one time. All right, now then, we got um, a burn valve is indicated, exhaust valve, if it is case from a tailpipe. Technician A says the condition of the vehicle should be, uh, could should be considered before replacing the faulty valve. We've already done that one. All consumption can be the result of what? Burn valves, yes. It can. Uh, non seated rings. Okay. Oh, my bad. This is actually a multiple choice question. Excessive valve spring tension, a faulty, a faulty vacuum modulator, worn valve seals, or insufficient skirt clearance. By the way, in the back of my Jeep is my uniform. I should have told you that too. <laughs> insufficient skirt clearance could do it because when the rod comes by, when the rod comes down the business, it gets pulled it and it can kind of move a little bit. And that old in there. Well, actually, that's going to be C on that one. That's what they're wanting. No one, the best answer, not the answer of what it could be. All right, let me ask you this. Um, how can uh, the timing belt be in a tooth off cause it to burn oil? C. 
seen it before. Oh, it has, oh, it has blow by real bad. How's it going to have blow by any work with the timing belt? Because it did. The pistons come up and it sparks and it wants to go back down and then it blows by the piston. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to scramble and trying to get. We, I talked about this the other day in one of my talks. I don't remember what I did last night. Well, yeah. This. <laughs> yeah. Then you have a problem. <laughs> Excuse me. Where were you on April 14th, 1971? There's five people in the world that they found that remember. That this, list, this, this is interesting. And this is a little off the subject. But there's five people in the world they found that can remember every day of their life what they did. Five people. And. Uh, you know that woman, that red-headed woman, that pretty lady named Mary Lou Henner that was on that show called Taxi? She's one of them. And if you tell her, what did you do on April 14th, 1974? She said, I bought groceries, I went to the beauty shop, I did this. And she remembers everything she did. And any day you pull up that she's ever lived from her earliest memory, she can tell you exactly, exactly what she did on that day. Does she remember what color things are and my specific details? Probably. Yeah. But, um, but anyway, it's, just, it's a strange thing. You know, they, you know we call you all do that. You know? I remember a lot, but I don't remember that much. Okay, now then, if the valve timing is advanced so that, let's say the intake valve is closing while the piston's still going down. Let's say it closes early and the piston's still pulling. It's going to pull all up past the rings. Oh, it's backwards. Yeah, it's going to pull all past the rings because now the intake valves are, are slammed shut early. You see, we're supposed to be, you know, when the intake valve is supposed to close, as this is the piston hitting the bottom, if the intake valve closes while the piston's still traveling down, you're going to suck all past those rings, and then whenever it lights off, you're going to see all smoke coming out the back. doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the ring, but it does mean, and a Honda car is the world's worst to do that. If it's one tooth off, the compression will be high, it'll burn off. Seen it in this shop. All right. Well, it's yep. Yeah, that's probably what's wrong with yours. Okay, now then. No, Technician A says excessive piston skirt clearance can cause piston slap. Piston bouncing about back, 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 back and forth. You just gonna skip 10? Yeah. yeah, I had highlighted that one, but I jumped over it for some strange reason. Somebody answer that one for me. Technician A says the oxygen sensor should be replaced if engine coolant has been burned. Yes or no? No. no, no. Yes. yes. You know why? There's silicone in the coolant, and it coats the ceramic zirconia oxygen sensor, and it doesn't work right. So what happens is when it comes back with a check engine light, they want it to be on you. So what you do is if it's blowing some gaskets, you better tell them they need an oxygen sensor if you're working in a shop. So, hey, you got gaskets blown. We burned some coolant, probably coated your oxygen sensor. You, your call, but if you don't put them on there, you gotta, you're going to need to realize it. You guys are too out of All right. So, the oxygen sensor should be replaced if engine coolant has been burned. Technician B says white exhaust smoke usually indicates a blown head gasket. Technician B says white exhaust smoke usually indicates a blown head gasket. True? True. 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 You can smell it too. It'll smell like antifreeze. Typically. Unless it's somebody's just been running clear water in it. Yeah. Mm. That's not good. Bad. Well, that girl here, that Michelle Taylor girl that's... Uh, the daughter of Lee's drinking father's drinking buddy, whatever. Uh, they were, she was. She had been to San. She, when she her car, uh, uh, I mean her vehicle was losing coolant at some point for some reason. I don't know why it was. And she just kept adding water to it. She just had clear water out of everything and all that, which is what Donna had been doing on her car, which should be going out of here today without no problem at all. We we'll have to redo the alignment after the steering thing is fixed. Um, so. We got both of them guys are right. That should be a C. Did you put C on number 10? If you didn't put C on number 10, you need to put C on number 10. And if you showed up late, do not copy answers from other people's tests because that's not what this is about. Getting the test thrown in the thing with the right answers is no good if you can't answer the question on your final exam. And I'll probably build a final exam where everybody's got different questions on the test like I did before. Like we did last Like we did before, yeah. Everybody, no, no two people have any of the same questions on the test, so everybody's going to look them up by themselves without stealing the answer from other people. Technician A says excessive piston clearance can cause piston slap. Technician B says piston slap cannot be repaired. Good brief. Technician A says excessive, okay, number 11. That's number 11, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Can, can piston slap be repaired? Yes. Did you know that some of the, there were some uh, pistons that were slapping on nearly brand new cars that I knew about one car company. 
And what they would do is they would have you pull the pistons out and send them to the machine shop to have the pistons knurled. Then you put them back in there and they didn't slap anymore. Because when you knurl them, you're basically... Well, you know what knurling is? Who, who doesn't know what knurling is? I don't know. You know what handle of a ratchet looks like? It's got the, the, the feels... It's got the little... Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, a little diamond-shaped little... That's knurled. But uh, if you can knurl it by just... What you do is you, you, you know, you... Squish a little bit of the metal out, and you know, you know, you know how like on a like a extension handle, mm -hmm. kind of like a one little piece, it's got like a piece where you grip yeah. it, yeah, yeah, it's nearly that. Uh, mm -hmm. Or the ratchet handle too, yeah, you know, whatever, anything like I just made to grab a hold of, but it makes this piston grow a tiny bit bigger when they do that, and it keeps it from snapping, and also it lets it lubricate there and all that. Like, oh, all right, technician A says. That was actually A. 11 was A. Technician A says excessive crankshaft end plate can cause engine knocks or clunks on acceleration. And technician B says a worn thrust bearing can cause excessive crankshaft end play. Who's correct about that? Knocks or clunks on acceleration. Now, what happens when you're, you got a car that you're, if you take off on a car that's got automatic transmission, you give it the gas, what's going on back in the transmission area? The total motor spinning and it's... It's spinning, but what else is happening? It's, pretty, it's making old pressure. Pump old pressure, pressure goes up. Yeah. Pump pressure goes up in the transmission. The burner swells a little bit. And when the torque burner swells a little bit, it pushes forward on the crankshaft. And when it pushes forward on the crankshaft, the thrust bearing can to handle it. If you match the clutch on a manual transmission car, the clutch, you're actually pushing forward on the crankshaft. Uh, occasionally, there'll be a rash of vehicles that will have torque converters that are a little thin or a little weak, and they'll swell too much, and they'll wipe out the dead gum. You'll have engine noises because the thrust bearing is, is wiped out. And that's just something you have to deal with, but you put, put another torque converter in there. Or crank wall when it happens. Yeah. All right. So, number 12. Who gave me a, give me a right answer for number 12, somebody? Uh, what did you say? Did you say? A's right. C. What about both of them. Both of them are right. There you go. When performing a cylinder leakage test, the technician should remove the radiator cap and the blank valve. PCV, PCV valve. What's PCV stand for? Positive crankshaft demolition. Crankshaft demolition? That's it. He went down in flames alone. Air leakage at the oil fill cap or dipstick. Oh, this let, let me hit you with this, too. I've said this before, but I want to say it again where you remember it. That's good looking. Your jerky you got over there. Stumbling over my words. Can't hear what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. IT yeah, can right. tangle up. All right. So, to a little, uh, you cap off the, remember when I told you, that's right. Okay. You cap off the uh, PCV valve and the close your hose and it's got vacuum in there. You know you're leaking intake from the underside, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if you cap the thing off and then you stick a hose on the dipstick uh, and you put a regulated air pressure of 15 pounds in there, you got your pressure in the crankcase with the air pressure leaks that way, can't you? Mm -hmm. Andy, if, if it's in the splash part of the oil, but what if it's in a pressurized place, yeah, like going it. through the head gasket? Why don't we take the oil sending unit out, screw a fitting in there, and put shop air pressure on there, 100 pounds. You'll find it, won't you? Oh, yeah. 100 pounds of gallery pressure? You don't have to have the engine running. It's going to squirt out of there. How, how, how bad do you want to find out where it's leaking, you know? You know, we, we put dye in there. We do all this other kind of stuff. So whatever. All leakage, air leakage of the oil filler cap or dipstick tube indicates worn what? Wings. It can put so much blow by in there the PCV system can't handle it. If the leakage of the oil filler cap is near 100%, the technician should expect damage to a what? Hmm? Piston. Some of those power stroke diesels, whenever they had problems like that, would actually blow smoke rings. Yeah, out the tailpipe. I mean, literally blow smoke rings. That was funny as all get out. And they would, they would all do it when they had trouble with the piston. Um, and you can, this is the other thing. If you take the oil filler cap off and you feel a lot of poof, poof, poof pressure coming out of there, you know you got some serious in, internal engine damage. To assure that the valves are closed and the rings will be at the highest point, the technician should turn the engine over by hand until the cylinder is at top dead center. Now we, hmm? Yeah, compression, top dead center, compression. Exactly. So you said top dead center, she gave you the rest of the answer, compression. All right. Uh, let me ask you this. On a uh, Detroit diesel engine, um, you know, like a, the diesel engine, um, if I turn my cylinder, why do I not need to worry about whether it's on top dead center compression or not? 
Because it's always on compression when it's top dead center. What? <laughs> it's a two cycle. What did you say? It's a two. I mean, a, a, a Detroit diesel is all you know is always on top dead center compression when it's a top dead center. It's a two cycle engine. Because it's, it's got holes around the side of the cylinder. The piston goes below those. The mix comes in. It squeezes. And bam! <laughs> you got some exhaust valves on the top of it. But the fact is, when it's the top dead center, you know. All right. That's. I mean, it's always the top dead center. It's a two cycle engine. If the engine, if the that's why it's got a blower. So on it. it has no cam. Huh? It has no cam. It's got a cam for the exhaust valves. Yeah. Well, it has, okay. It has and no for the fuel rail. Yeah. So uh, no. this is not diesel. So get out of here. Me and me and. Uh, uh, me and Casey, we don't hear nothing about no diesel. Okay, and they're right, Casey. All right. And then one about this and this building. Okay, well, all right then. No, I got you crossed up with somebody else. There's another guy come up here who said he didn't want to hear about no diesel. That guy from National Auto Diesel College. Mm -hmm. If the leakage at the oil fill cap is near 100, percent we already talked about that. Uh, let's look at 17. That's the next one we need. We're almost done here. Piston blank occurs when there's too much clearance between the piston and cylinder. Slap. That's a slap. You know. All right. A clogged or frozen blank or hose can cause a tremendous amount of blue exhaust smoke. Yeah, if it's clogged up. All that's contaminated with blank may cause major bottom end damage. Metal. What? Metal shaving? A little coolant. Oh. Yeah. A partially plugged or restricted catalytic converter can trigger the MIL and set a blank for low catalyst. <coughs> DTC. A DTC. What, what would the DTC be? Number? Can I pull that number for you? Yeah. P four twenty. P four twenty. Maybe. All right. Okay. That takes care of that. And everybody, Greg is a. Uh, Greg has got uh, Lee, Lee. Let me tell you, Greg has got um, valves and some new rocker arms for that four six back there. Okay. So y'all can put that thing back together, but make darn sure. Uh, let me point, let me point something out here, y'all. I'm gonna I'm gonna bust open my. Uh